people. Open our eyes to see you, Lord. Visit us through your Holy Spirit. I ask that you rise with me. Please take your hymnal, turn, turn to hymn number 562. Be thou my vision. to take a moment for us to greet one another. Get your morning. Good morning, Carla. Morning, Browers. Morning. 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 Hey there. Good morning. So I don't want to shake you. Oh, you're sick? All right. Good morning. Good morning. But good morning. All right. <laughs> hey there. Thanks. Good morning. Hey there. Good morning, Kim. Hey. Good morning. Okay, if you turn in your hymnals once again to song number 11, Come Thou Fount.
take your programs once again. We have a responsive reading from Psalm 34. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Fear the Lord, you as saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. Evil will slay the wicked, the foes of the righteous will be condemned. Okay. Thank you. You may be seated. I ask that you join with me in prayer. Lord, we come before you this day. Uh, Lord, we are in awe of all of the things that you're able to do around us. Uh, Lord, you are in control of the weather. You are in control of the details. You are in control of things that are seen and unseen. Lord, we ask that we remember this and remember that who you are as we see the things that we don't understand unfold. Lord, I pray for those who are not able to be with us here today through illness, uh, through travels. Uh, pray for those who have ongoing health issues. Lord, I ask that you lift us up as a body and you help us to be both sensitive to you and caring to work towards one another. Lord, I ask that you watch over us to service, that we would be sensitive to your spirit and that we could take uh, with us your words, not ours. In Jesus' name, amen. Take your hymnal again. Please turn to hymn number 705.
Take your Bibles now and turn with me to Matthew chapter 26, verse 14. Uh, we're going to begin on page 1543. <clears throat> it's a rather long reading, and I guess I didn't know which parts to uh, cut out or not, but I would like as we're reading it that you would please be paying attention specifically to how Peter <clears throat> and Judas how are, are uh, interacting with Christ. So once again, Matthew 26, verse 14. So we pick up where Judas is going to betray Jesus. <clears throat> then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they counted out for him thirty silver coins. <clears throat> Excuse me. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. <clears throat> on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him, one after another, surely not I, Lord. Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus answered, Yes, it is you. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of this vine from now on until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, This very night, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed. My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. 
So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of, Lord, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? At that time, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Um, we are going to skip uh, the next few sections. Uh, please go with me to verse 69. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another girl saw him and said to the people there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you're one of them, for your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me. Three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people came to the decision to put Jesus to death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the thirty silver coins to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. So Jesus, Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priests picked up the coins and said, It is against the law to put this into the treasury, since it is blood money. So he decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the thirty silver coins, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. Today I'm going to be talking about what we do with remorse. Um, in this passage, that is the, the part that I wanted to focus on. Both Peter and Judas did something uh, that led to their remorse. Judas, having betrayed Christ, uh, eventually kills himself. Peter, having disowned Christ. And for what it's worth, in his denial of Christ, understand that it goes up in uh, severity each time. The first time he says, I didn't know him. The second time he, th he swore an oath, basically saying, you know, as God is my witness, I did not know him. And the third time it says he swore and repeated the oath because he was that uh, annoyed by it. He was filled with bitterness. Uh, when you look at the Gospel of John, uh, Christ makes a point to have a special conversation with Peter to restore him back. <clears throat> And Peter, filled with remorse, turns to Christ and uh, serves Christ to his death. Two stories, same time, both filled with remorse. The one turns to despair, and the other turns to repentance. By the way, the word repentance means to turn. To turn to Christ is what repentance would mean in this, in this situation. Um, 
I want to talk about, I hadn't planned on talking about this. I had known I was going to be speaking for some time. And as most of you know, I usually have something from the Old Testament. I was going to be speaking from the Psalms. But with recent events, um, it's just been a burden on my heart to address the issue of suicide. Um, it's not just related to what has happened with the Dykeshorn family. Um, I'd like to tell another story briefly. I'm trying to avoid names so as not to draw undue attention to the people, but the people that I'm referencing are nearby. My wife had a student who had grown up without her father. Her mother had done a pretty reasonable job of raising her to the best of her ability, but the daughter, as is the want of any child, wanted to know who her father was. <clears throat> and the mother kept saying, you don't, no, no. Finally, when she was a senior in high school, her mother let her know that he lived nearby, uh, but he was a drug addict, that he had all kinds of issues in his life, that uh, he, wasn't, uh, he wasn't in control of himself. But the daughter wanted to meet him. Uh, eventually, they arranged it so that she could spend the weekend with him. It's a short drive over to where he lived. She shows up on a Friday night, brought her things. I don't know the details in between, but later in the evening, she returned to find that her father, whom she just met, had taken all the things that she had brought and sold them to get drugs. When she confronted him about it, he beat her up. She left the house with nothing, and late at night got a ride home, and the guy who gave her a ride home sexually assaulted her. She graduated, started college, was doing reasonably well. About a week and a half ago, she killed herself. I believe age 19. She's pregnant. We don't know the details as to how it happened or why, but one of the things that happens <coughs> psychologically is when a woman experiences the traumas of pregnancy, it often will trigger deeper memories of harms from the past. We don't know. What we do know is she felt like she was a burden and she felt like she had nothing left to offer. Filled with remorse. I'd like to tell another story. <clears throat> There's a French couple, and he had the most French of French names, Jacques. Uh, his wife is Ariane. They lived in the region of France that is uh, bordering Germany, Alsace. Uh, unusual place. This is the place that Germany took from France, and in World War I, the French tried to get it back. Eventually, they got it back. They speak their own language, Alsatian, which is closer to German than French. But the French being French, make sure that everybody speaks French. So now they're French. He was a baker. They had a bakery in the town of, I believe it's pronounced Colmar. Uh, I would say excuse my French, but that would imply that I have French, so I don't. Um, beautiful little touristy town, cobblestone streets. Uh, they had a idyllic existence. <clears throat> He's a French baker, so you know he was good. Uh, they are happily married, didn't have children until they were older. They had one son. Beautiful boy. Um, Ariane had piercing blue eyes, uh, the kind of crystal blue that um, I, I don't know how else to describe it. And her son had blue eyes, and they loved him. He's all they had. When he was 10 years old, he was diagnosed with leukemia, and he died. As you can imagine, they had a lot of struggles to deal with what now. 
They talked about having another child, but they both said, what's the point? They didn't know what to do. They both were in depression. And one day Ariane said to Jacques, I don't want to live. He said, I don't either. So they made a pact. They said, we will spend the next year looking for meaning, purpose, anything that makes life worth living. And at the end of that year, uh, if we haven't found anything, we will kill ourselves together. Why do people commit suicide? Usually when we think of that question, we think of individuals and we start to come up with the reasons. But in doing that, we often assume that we know reasons that aren't necessarily what we think they are. Often there's shame, guilt involved, but not always. Often there's depression, usually there's depression, but not always. We have Romeo and Juliet and the story of loneliness and broken heart in what is possibly one of the strangest stories that we still refer back to as something heroic that these teenage kids killed themselves over something that was quite fixable. Hopelessness, that's a big one. When you are in a situation where you feel like there's no way it's gonna change and things can't get better, you begin to wonder, maybe there's a way that uh, I can just end this. The pain is too much. Meaninglessness, purposelessness, same thing. In the example I gave, it's also quite common that people feel like there's such a burden that the world would literally be better off if they weren't in it. And they talk themselves into that. Often it's a combination of these things. Almost always there's some element of pain that's overwhelming. There's other things too. Uh, people you wouldn't expect have a very, very high suicide rate. Professional athletes, um, successful musicians, successful actors. Often it's one of two things. Either they're no longer able to do what once brought them prestige and fame, a retired professional athlete. Uh, what do you do when you retire if you're used to 60, 70,000 people cheering for you? When you realize you can't do what you have come to align with your life. This is true whether you're a successful farmer and it's taken away, or if you're uh, an actor and for whatever reason you're no longer able to do what you've done. I want to tell some more stories. Most of what I'm going to talk about are stories, and I hope that when we're done, I tie them together. So I'll do my best. But I want to talk about one other story. I said that I didn't plan on talking about this originally, but things just piled on top of each other. Um, this past week, a woman who's very near and dear to me died of old age. Her name's Joan Johnson. When I was a kid, Joan uh, was a Sunday school teacher in my hometown. Uh, she had CBY, which to this day I'm still not sure what it stands for, but it was the Christian youth group after uh, school that she'd work with. She was a registered nurse, but she was involved with every activity imaginable that involved working with uh, children at church, outside of church, summer camps. Um, she was a Wednesday night youth group leader for middle school and for younger kids. Uh, she taught me how to pray. At the end of her life, her daughter, who was a, a few years younger than me, she had a lot of pain. Um, she shared some of it with us. Some of it wasn't appropriate for our age. At the end of her life, um, her daughter, who was a few years older than me, was uh, good friends with my, my sister-in-law especially, but my brother also, older brother, said that Joan was haunted by what had happened when she was a child. She'd been molested. 
and it haunted her her whole life. So she had spent her life trying to help children, to protect children, work for children. But when she was in her 80s and on her deathbed, she still struggled with feelings of worthlessness, a feeling that she was dirty because of what had happened to her. There are some pains that don't fully go away, but there's still hope. The difference between despair and repentance is enormous. It's 180 degrees difference. It doesn't matter what has happened to you. It doesn't matter what you have done. There is hope for forgiveness in Christ. But if instead you turn on yourself and you look to yourself, nothing will ever be good enough. There's no amount of fame or fortune or anything that can make somebody whole again apart from Christ. You can feel good for a while. But if a Job-like experience happens <clears throat> where you start to lose your family, the things that matter to you, the things that you identify as being part of who you are, there's nobody who's above feelings of despair if they don't focus on Christ. As most of you know, <clears throat> I spent three years of my life in Kabul, Afghanistan. This hits home for me. Why Kabul, Afghanistan? I was 34 years old. <clears throat> I was lonely. I wasn't without hope. But the idea of going to a country where there was a war and where there was the potential for being killed, I can't say that that was unattractive. I knew that there was a need. I knew that there was a need that I could help be a part of. But I wasn't afraid of dying because at some level I was kind of tired of living. I went to Kabul for a one-year commitment. <clears throat> While I was there, I realized that God had a purpose for me there. I was already a Christian. It was, I don't know how to explain this because usually what ends up coming out of this is some people think that, oh, you're saying you weren't a Christian, or other people uh, can justify feelings of despair. I don't mean either. It was something I had struggled with. But being in that place <clears throat> at that time with those people who had struggled through so much and hearing their stories, having a 16-year-old girl in my class <clears throat> who would first day in school, she spilled my coffee. And I said, it's okay, sit down. I started wiping it up and she started crying because I was wiping up the coffee she'd spilled. She had been sold as a child bride by her parents who had nothing at age eight, had been abused for years, had somehow <clears throat> been able to get in contact with uh, American military people who snuck her into a halfway shelter for battered women when she was about 12. She wasn't the youngest one there. There was another girl two years younger who had had the same sort of experience. The reason why the girl was crying when I was cleaning up the coffee was because she had never experienced a man doing something kind for her before. She'd never known forgiveness. Today she's a professor at Kabul University, happily married with children of her own, beautiful children. When life seems hopeless, you don't know what God has in store. I don't think I'll ever be to a, I hope I'll never be to a place again that's as poor and war-torn as I was when I was in Kabul. But I've also never seen so much love and hope. <clears throat> the school that I was at <clears throat> was a secular school, but it was run by a Christian missionary agency. Everybody there was a believer and took to heart serving Christ. And the verse that says, uh, always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that is in you, was our mantra. We did not go around talking about our faith. You can't in that country. 
but we tried to live out our lives in such a way that people would ask us, why do you seem different? And they did. I wanted to show a video um, from the time that I was in Afghanistan. <coughs> I have talked before about a man from, uh, I can't remember if it's Dolan, I believe, South Dakota, who, first of all, he went to South Dakota State, so I have to forgive that. He worked for John Deere, I have to forgive that. But he was a great guy anyway. Um, he was over there and gave up an incredible career to work with uh, the poorest of the poor, helping to bring electricity into these mountain villages where uh, he designed a water generator for them. He's just one example of countless people that I would meet there. There was this two sorts of people who did uh, work in Afghanistan. There were these people like this man who gave up everything to go there. And in doing so, were touching people's lives in ways that you just can't imagine. There were also people who were there who worked for the UN and other organizations who could claim that they were doing, you know, work to help the poor, but in reality they had servants at home, drivers, and they lived a lifestyle that they probably would not have been able to live anywhere else. And they were both there together, and they both would fall often under the same umbrella of working for an NGO, non-government organization. One of the groups that I got to know while I was there um, was a group that worked with orphans and widows, and as it says in Galatians, there's no pure religion in working with orphans and widows. And uh, I just want to show a brief video clip of that group. If uh, I kind of sprung this on Davis this morning, so I'm not sure if it's going to work, but is it going to work, Davis? Okay, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it so that... Um, They started out working with a Christian organization and they saw so many orphans in the streets who uh, they would do things like they would sell gum. So in such a poor country, at the time I was there, the, the uh, average income of, a, of an income earning age person was a dollar a day. That was the median income. Over half the country made less than a dollar a day. In that type of a society, you have to have the children work. The most common things that the children would do is uh, uh, a lot of them would go out the street and resell gum. So they'd buy a pack of gum and they would sell a piece of gum. And so if they'd buy the pack of gum for, let's say, 15 cents, and there's five pieces in a pack, if they could get you to pay four or five cents for one piece, they're making money. And they would do that all day. And there would be hordes of children doing this sort of thing. Cigarettes, everything imaginable that would be something that you would grab as you're walking by. The other thing that they would often do uh, is Afghan carpets. Um, we often sit back in America and talk about child labor as being this horrible thing, which it is. You don't want your kids to have to go work in a, I joke with my kids all the time, at least you're not working in a coal mine. Um, but over there, it's, it's all they know. So it's a very common thing that the kids will go find scraps of clothing, scraps of whatever, pull the material apart, and they will rework it into carpets. Um, it's very common to have very small houses, sometimes single room houses, that basically, are, for all intents and purposes, are a little concrete cave. And in the middle of that, in the middle of, the, of that, uh, they'll have a loom for the carpet. Many of what bigger it is, the more they sell for. And they will take everything they have, and they will start weaving it together as a family. Um, I liked the carpets when I was there. I bought one and I brought it back to the guy who worked at our house who knew a lot about carpets, who was Afghan. He's like, ah, this is a bad one. I was like, why? He's like, it's made by children. I said, that's kind of what I thought. That's why I bought it. Um, but anyway, this organization came out, started working with these kids and these people in these situations, and I think that they said it's ready to go now. Is it ready? Okay. It's about a three-minute video. They're going to show scenes, actually, of the neighborhood where I lived.
During the showing of it, you may have seen this woman appearing several times throughout. I started out by talking about Jacques and Ariane. That's Ariane. <clears throat> when Jacques and Ariane spent that year trying to figure out what in life had meaning, <clears throat> They studied philosophy, Eastern religions, every, everything they could come across. And eventually somebody introduced them to Christ. At the end of the year, they were dedicated to Christ and felt like God was calling them to live their lives to help other children. I heard Ariane share her testimony on Easter morning, 2006. <clears throat> And it's haunted me. In her words, the Lord took away our son, but in doing so, introduced us to his. And now, instead of having one child, we have thousands. 5,000 children that they've served. You can't see the picture very well, but the look on her face is one of pure joy. She's been there since 2000. In 2013, her husband, Jacques, died of cancer, but she couldn't stay away. So she goes home to France every once in a while, raises money, and goes back and helps the kids there again. Started a program to work with deaf kids. In a country that poor, um, it's difficult enough for the poor children, but kids that have special needs, it's, it's beyond it's beyond despair. These are the people she has a heart for. When you look at those situations that I've gone through, almost every example I've given while I've talked have been two people who were facing a moment of crisis or despair or hurt or pain, and they had to make a choice. Peter repented, and he served Christ for the rest of his life. Judas was filled with remorse, admitted that what he did was wrong and sinful, and then killed himself. The girl who I discussed didn't know her father and was suffered trauma, killed herself. Joan Johnson spent decades serving children touching lives that we won't understand until heaven. It's a choice. There's nothing that is so low that God can't redeem it. Nothing of so much pain that God can't redeem it. 
there's also nothing too shallow that without God, people wouldn't kill themselves. If you're an actress and you lose your looks, there's a reason. If you're a musician, you lose your voice, there's a reason. If you're a farmer and lose your farm, there's a reason. But you'll never know what could have been. This especially hits home in my life. I never knew until I was a, a grown man that my grandfather had killed himself. My dad, I knew, had grown up without a father. At 87, his dad had died. My dad was the youngest of seven children. His father was respected in the community, and I don't know the sequence of events that led to it, but apparently he was asked to run for some sort of political position. He didn't win, uh, grew depressed, bitter, angry, and eventually he hung himself. He hung himself in the barn so that his teenage son found his body when he came out to do chores. I think it was about age 14, 15. The son had to take the body down and hide it so the younger ones wouldn't see it. What kind of a coward does that? One of the things that happens with suicide is people usually end up getting so self-absorbed that they have no thought for others. So most end up doing it in their own home. So guess who finds them? A lot of people see Hemingway. Ernest Hemingway walked from one room where his wife was into another room and shot himself with both barrels of a 12-gauge shotgun in the family living room. I don't want to be gory, but can you imagine what that was like? That is what self-absorption and the desire to destroy yourself looks like. Ariane is what it looks like when you give God a chance. My dad <clears throat> frequently said he never knew what it was to have a father, so he wanted to make sure his kids knew. My brothers and I abused that. My dad was a farmer. He milked cows. I cannot tell you how many times he was working on the tractor, probably as stressful a times as you can imagine right now. And we walk up with a baseball glove and a baseball and said, Dad, you want to play catch? Never said no. Never. When I was older and I understood how much time and how much difficulty was involved with that, I asked him about it. And he said, I never had a dad. And I wanted to make sure that you did. My father's mother knew the Lord and it saved that family. Almost everybody in this room either knows somebody who's committed suicide or in some way, shape, or form is connected to them. And it's an insidious thing. Right now, in South Dakota, the leading cause of death among Native American males is alcohol-related traffic accidents. Second leading cause is suicide. The life expectancy of Native American men is continuously falling. I haven't heard where it is now, but last I heard it was getting close to age 40. They're connected. When you live a life of despair, people often turn to alcohol. When you don't care whether you live or drive, die, you often don't mind if you drink and drive. And if life has lost all meaning and all you have to talk about are those moments of glory in high school sports or whatever else that are not going to come back to you, it's frequently a choice that uh, increasingly people are making. And the way that it's insidious is, is that as soon as one person does it, it puts the idea into the heads of everybody else around them. And people who were not even thinking in that way suddenly think, well, if he did it, hmm, and it grows like a cancer. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid that that could happen here. 
you yourselves know what I just said, that you have a choice to turn to God. By the way, if you go back to those examples, one of the things that happened with Judas is he didn't go to Christ. Despair often means you don't want to change your life. I want to hide the sin. Sometimes it's done because of shame, but I don't, I don't want people to know what's on the inside. Repentance is saying, I want to get rid of what's on the inside. I'll make the changes. We have people around us that struggle with these same things. And it is our calling as Christians to be Christ's ambassador to those people. We talked about this at the consistory meeting the other night, and one of our members shared that uh, he had an experience where he just had a woman's name and was on his heart, and he can't stop thinking about her, so he finally called her up and said, hey, how you doing? And she was angry with him, upset with him. So why'd you call me? Why'd you call me now? And it came out that she was about to kill herself and literally stopped to answer the phone. Um, those stories are all around us. Sometimes we know it, sometimes we don't. So the first thing I would hope that you take away from the day is just the knowledge that there's nothing so low that God can't redeem it. And that's true in your life and those around you. But also I hope that you don't need to move to Afghanistan and start working with orphans to touch the lives of the people around you. So I ask that you would look for opportunities. If you're praying and somebody keeps popping into your mind, obviously you should pray for them. But I don't think anybody's ever gotten upset with you for you calling them up and saying, hey, how are you doing? I want this to end. But it doesn't end because we speak about the ills of suicide. It ends because people turn to Christ. And that's what we need to have happen. Bow with me in prayer. Lord, we thank you for loving us, for being able to forgive us, accept us, love us as we are, but love us so much that you want us to change into your image. Lord, we ask that you help us to do that. And we ask that you help us to be sensitive to those around us in whose lives you're also working. Lord, I ask that as we leave this meeting, that you'll bring people to mind who need to know you, who want to know you, and that you would be able to show us clearly that you're calling us to um, be blessed by helping them to know you better. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I ask that the ushers please come forward. Now is the time for the offering.
Lord, we thank you for these things that we're able to offer back to you. We ask that, you would, that we would offer not only our gifts, but ourselves. I ask that you accept these gifts and use us and our resources for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord lift us up. May he use our hands and our lips for his service. May his heart shine through ours. May we be sensitive to those around us. May we love the Lord, our God, with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And may we love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Amen. Please turn in your hymnal. I'm oh, sorry, not in the hymnal. It's on the overhead in Christ alone. <laughs> 